So hello everybody for this new uh, Comsoc video seminar. We have uh, two speakers today. The first one will be Francois Durand uh, from uh, the Nokia Bell Labs. We will talk about coalitional manipulability, coalitional manipula manipulability. And next we'll have uh, Zoe uh, Terzopoulou, who we, is just inaugurating a new office in Saint-Étienne. So it's a brand new and big office in Saint-Étienne that she has just, uh, was just settled this week. Let me remind you that if you want to have a question, you can uh, just put a question in the chat and uh, with a question, and then we will either answer them, uh, we'll see, we'll review them probably most likely at the end of the talk during the question session. So now I think, uh, yes, we're all set. Francois, you have 20 minutes to present your works, and after we'll go for 10 minutes of questions. So Francois, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Um, thanks for, for thanks for inviting me to the Comsoc seminar. So, I will talk, as you said, about uh, coalitional manipulation of voting rules, um, and it's a paper in a journal called Constitutional Political Economy. Uh, so, I will talk about single winner voting rules. Uh, I will call. I will talk about coalitional manipulation. So, namely. Uh, if there is a subset of the voters who can, by casting an insincere ballot, um, get a result that they prefer to the natural result of the election. Uh, of course, uh, you all know the Gibbard Setters by theorem stating that uh, any uh, non trivial voting rule is sensible to. Um, individual manipulation, but a fortiori uh, coalitional manipulation. And so that's a problem that we cannot avoid completely. And we would like to uh, minimize its scope. Um, and that's uh, what we are going to, uh, to evaluate uh, on uh, several uh, voting groups. So I'm going to start with uh, the experimental setting. And uh, I will mention a bit of theory in passing. Uh, and then I will give the, the results of uh, the article and I will co briefly conclude. So in the paper, we use two data sets. Uh, the first one is um, uh, comes from the Netflix prize. Uh, so essentially, we have a huge number of uh, users uh, assigning grades to uh, some movies. So of course, it's a very sparse matrix because many, uh, most users don't put a grade uh, on most movies, uh, but what you can do is that you can extract some uh, sub matrices that are uh, full matrices, and these matrices look like a preference profile. And more more precisely, they, they look like a cardinal preference profile. But you can uh, uh, you can draw from that uh, ordinal preferences or keep keep them cardinal if you want to uh, to study cardinal voting rules. Uh, in the paper, we also um, use another data set uh, that was given to us by an organization called Fair Vote, um, which advocates for uh, the use of uh, IRV uh, in the US. Uh, and it's a data set made of uh, US elections for several types of, um, of, uh, of positions like member of city council, uh, board of supervisors for, for schools and stuff like that. Uh, and they are, they are ranked data and usually it's truncated, uh, truncated the rankings. Uh, I will not give the, the results about the second data set, but essentially qualitatively the results are similar to what we get with the Netflix data set. Uh, so from this big sparse matrix of the, uh, of the Netflix prize, we extract many full, rank ma uh, full, uh, full matrices uh, with a number of candidates ranging from three to 11. Uh, we don't want more than 11 con candidates because we, we would have uh, computational uh, issues related to computing manipulability for certain voting votes. And uh, we have numbers of vote voters ranging from uh, 1,000 to approximately uh, 100,000. Um, we are going to study a lot of voting rules, more or less all the classical rules of the literature. So uh, the um, uh, plurality, border, veto, uh, instant run of uh, voting that you may know as STV or uh, ranked choice voting or as alternative votes, uh, depending on your country, personal preferences, and so on. Uh, 
uh, exhaustive ballot, which is the, yeah, just a, a non-instant version of uh, instant runoff voting, the two round system, uh, the iterated versions of Borda that are uh, Baldwin and Nelson, the iterative uh, versions of Veto that are Coombs and Kemrush. Uh, we also study some cardinal voting rules like approval voting, uh, range voting, majority judgment, uh, star, which uh, consists in uh, uh, giving grades and then do a, a second round. Uh, we also have Bucklin. Uh, and uh, of course, we have a bunch of uh, Condorcet uh, voting rules. So I will briefly, briefly recall some Condorcet, Condorcet notions. If you uh, have a look at the weighted majority matrix uh, of a preference profile, uh, of course, if one candidate uh, wins all pairwise comparisons, then she's called the Condorcet winner. Uh, in this particular exam, there is even a Condorcet order in the sense that the second candidate, con candidate wins against, against all the other and so on. Uh, in some cases, of course, there is no Condorcet winner. Uh, but you can define the Smith set, uh, which is the smallest set of candidates, uh, such that each candidate of this set wins against each candidate that is not inside the Smith set. Um, so uh, the, the Condor, some, some Condorcet rules that we that we study uh, are Copeland, Maximin, Black, Frank, Pears, Schulz, Split Cycle, uh, and another one that's called the Vienna rule. Uh, in addition to some Condorcet rules that I've already mentioned, uh, like Baldwin and Nelson, which are uh, actually Condorcet rules. Uh, we also study a bunch of Condorcet variants of IRV. Uh, so there are several ways to mix uh, the ID of uh, IRV and the, the Condorcet notion. Uh, the first one is Condorcet, Condorcet IRV, uh, the ID being simply that you uh, first, you test whether there is a Condorcet winner or not, and if there is, you, you elect her, and if not, then you run IRV uh, as usual. Uh, in Benham, uh, uh, in fact, as long as you don't have a Condorcet winner, you will eliminate the candidate with the lowest plurality score as if you were in IRV, and as soon as there is a Condorcet winner in the resulting profile, you stop and you, you elect the resulting Condorcet winner. In Tideman, uh, uh, it will rely on the Smith set, and that's why uh, I wanted to define it uh, in the, the previous slide. Uh, so if there is a Condorcet winner, it's uh, ended anyway. Um, and uh, alternatively, you will eliminate the candidates that are outside the Smith set, which implies that if there is a Condorcet winner, in fact, you, you eliminate everybody but her. Um, and then once you are restricted to the Smith set, you will remove the candidates with the lowest plurality score. And then you compute again the Smith sets, you remove all the candidates that are outside the Smith set and so on. Um, in Smith IRV, you eliminate all the, candidate, all the candidates that are outside the Smith set, but you do it only once, contrary to uh, Tideman's method. Um, and then you run IRV on the restricted profile. And uh, in the Woodall rule, uh, in fact, in parallel, you will compute the Smith set and you would compute the result in IRV. And you will take among the candidates of the Smith set, the one that is eliminated latest in IRV. <clears throat> so to, um, to assess the manipulability of the voting rules, uh, I use a Python package that I uh, designed uh, that is called SRAMP. Uh, for a simulator of various voting algorithm in manipulating populations. Uh, that is still evolving, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the main feature of the package is to be able to compute uh, uh, coalitional manipulability, but also individual manipulati manipulability for a wide range of uh, voting rules. Um, I need also to say a few words about the kind of uh, algorithms that we use to compute the coalitional manipulability uh, of the voting rules. Uh, so for uh, approval voting, majority judgment, plurality, range voting, star, two run system, uh, veto and Bucklin. Uh, in fact, the algorithm is exact and runs in polynomial time. 
um, for uh, Borda, Maximin, and Schulte. It's an approxim uh, approximate algorithm in, in the sense that it's really an approximation scheme with the approximation guarantees uh, that runs in polynomial time. Uh, for exhaustive ballot uh, and uh, Coombs and IRV, uh, we use an exact algorithm, but that, that runs in non-polynomial time. And that's why we want to restrict to uh, not having too many candidates. Um, and for um, the, uh, the other voting rules, we use heuristics. And uh, what do these heuristics do? In fact, uh, these heuristics uh, try to prove that the profile is manipulable. And if they manage to prove it, then they, they output yes. They also try to prove that the profile is not manipulable. And if it's the case, they uh, output no. And if they are unable to uh, prove that it's manipulable, but also unable to prove that it's not, uh, then they just uh, output, um, well, I don't know. But uh, what is, is interesting is, in fact, um, when you have an answer, you're sure that the answer is true. <clears throat> so let's uh, continue with the results. So first, I will say a few words about the qualitative features of the, um, of the profiles. Um, so in a, a large majority of the cases, in fact, there is a Condorcet winner and there, there is even a Condorcet order. Uh, in maybe 7% of the cases, there is a resistant Condorcet winner, uh, which is defined as a candidate that um, would have a majority in each three candidate comparison. And why is this uh, uh, notion interesting? It's interesting because um, it's equivalent uh, to having a profile that is not manipulable in any Condorcet rule. Uh, so that will, that will give an upper bound of manipulability for all Condorcet voting rules. And uh, in uh, yeah, maybe 5% of the cases, there is a majority of favorite in the sense that uh, it's the, the top candidate for a majority of, uh, of voters. Uh, so to evaluate the coalitional manipulability, the most simple indi indicator is the CM rate, which is defined as the proportion of profiles that are um, coalitionally manipulable. Uh, and uh, here the results are essentially that uh, all the voting rules from wh what I would call the IRV family uh, are much more resilient to, um, to strategic voting than all the other rules that we, we study in this article. Uh, so uh, these rules are IRV, exhaustive ballot, and all the Condorcet variants of uh, IRV that I, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, here in uh, purple, you see the, uh, um, the upper bound given by the notion of resistant Condorcet winner. Uh, so no Condorcet voting rules can be uh, more manipulable than that. Uh, and in particular, you can uh, observe, for example, that uh, Black's rule, uh, despite being a Condorcet voting rule, is almost as bad as it can theoretically be. Um, then we also uh, use, sorry, uh, okay. Um, we also study the notion of unison manipulability where all the manipulators should use the same ballot. It's in interesting in particular because uh, it's easier to compute, uh, but it's also in some sense a more realistic notion because uh, there is no problem of coordination. It's much more easy to, uh, um, to put this kind of manipulation in place in real life. Uh, so here again, the, the, the results are similar. We also use another notion of uh, manipulation, uh, which we call trivial manipulation, which is based on the simple uh, manipulation heuristic. Uh, and the results, once again, are similar. Uh, I will skip that for a reason of time. Uh, and then we have a look at the, um, uh, which candidates can benefit from the manipulation. OK. so. Uh, if I say that the profile is, is coalitionally manipulable, uh, 
the situation is not the same if it's coalitionally manipulable in favor of one candidate or if it's coalitionally manipulable in favor of any uh, candidate um, that is not the, the natural winner. So here uh, we compute the average ratio of CM winners. Uh, I mean, the, the, the proportion of candidates that are not the natural winner, but who can win by coalition on manipulation. Uh, so unsurprisingly for, for IRV, it's very, very, very IRV and related rules is very uh, small. Uh, and you can observe, for example, that for some rules like range voting or star, in, in fact, the proportion is close to one, meaning that not only these rules are very often manipulable, but in fact, they are manipulable in favor of the candidates, essentially. Uh, then a bit more in detail. So here, this, uh, this bar plot gathers all the profiles, uh, and in particular, it mixes profiles with the three candidates, with other profiles that have uh, 11 candidates and so on. So in particular for this question, it's interesting to uh, to look a bit in detail to what, uh, to what happens depending on the number of candidates. So here um, I, I plot what happens for this, the number of candidates who, who, who can benefit from coalitional manipulation um, as a function of the number of candidates in the election. So uh, I don't put all the rules here. In fact, I, I put all, only the rules for which uh, the algorithmic uncertainty is uh, uh, small enough. Uh, it's, it's interesting because for most rules, in fact, it's more or less linear in the sense that for, for, for plurality, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you see it's um, yeah, almost all the candidates, for example, whatever the number of candidates. Uh, for, uh, I don't know, a Buckley, it's more or, less, more or less half of the candidates. And there's uh, an interesting exception to, to that, which is the two round system, which is here in brown. Uh, so at the beginning, so for three candidates, two round system is, uh, uh, is almost not manipulable, which is not surprising because for three candidates, it's equivalent to, uh, to IRV. Um, but for a large number of candidates, in, in fact, the two-round system begins to, to become very bad. Uh, and in fact, the battery of my cell phone uh, <laughs> died, so I, I don't know what time it is, sorry. Ah, okay, I have a few minutes left, I guess. Um, here we have a look at the, yeah, at the um, Condorcet violation rate. So the probability that the Condorcet winner is not elected conditionally on the fact that there exists a Condorcet winner. So in blue, the bars represent what happens with sincere voting. So of course, for a Condorcet voting rule, like, uh, I don't know, uh, ranked pairs, uh, there is no blue bar because uh, ranked pairs never violates the Condorcet pr principle uh, uh, sincerely. And uh, the orange bar represents what happens um, taking, taking uh, manipulation into account. And here it's very interesting because, in fact, uh, despite the fact that uh, some um, IRV, for, for example, or exhaustive ballots may violate the Condorcet uh, principle, in fact, not so much, and um, not much more when uh, taking into account manipulation. Here we have something similar with the loss of uh, social welfare. So the, the results are essentially similar. And to, to finish, I will present a, a last indicator um, that I call the CM power index. Uh, the idea being essentially that uh, what bugs me in manipulation is not so much the fact that it will change uh, the end results of the election. What bugs me personally uh, is the fact that uh, it gives very different um, quantities of power to uh, strategic voters and to sincere voters. So that's what we try to measure here. So the idea is to say that this index is equal to X. Uh, intuitively, if a strategic voter has X times as much power as a sincere voter. And how do we, do we define that? Uh, we, we take the, the profile. We, um, so if I study, for example, the manipulation, so the sincere winner is W and my target winner is C. 
So I uh, take only the sincere voters, so the one who prefers uh, W to C, and then I solve the uh, constructive coalition, uh, coalitional manipulation problem. Uh, how many uh, manipulators do I need to add to make C win? And if the number of manipulators that, that I need is approximately equal to the number of uh, sincere voters, then I will say that my CM power index is equal to one. And if it's, uh, for example, um, uh, half as much, then I will say that my CM power index is equal to two because my uh, manipulators are, are twice more powerful individually than, uh, than the sincere voters. So here again, unsurprisingly, um, for uh, IRV and related rules, uh, this index is close to one, meaning that in practice, uh, IRV and related rules um, realize the one, uh, one person, one vote principle, uh, whereas some voting rules like uh, range voting or star can go as far as five or six meaning intuitively that a, a strategic voter has five or six times more power than, than a sincere voter. So uh, to conclude, um, uh, we saw that IRV and its variants are much more resilient to a coalition of manipulability than um, the other classic voting rules that we studied. Um, I, I, I didn't point, point it out, but in fact, the differences between the rules of the IRV family are uh, very small, um, uh, and we would need uh, more precise uh, evaluations to uh, to know uh, to compare them. And for the future, um, we would like to improve the algorithms that are used in Swarm for some voting rules for which we have a. Uh, uh, a big uncertainty, uh, uncertainty bar. And I put future work uh, in quotes be, be, because in fact, this article uh, was made one year ago and only accepted uh, one week ago. And in the meantime, in fact, Swamp was uh, already um, improved and uh, there are already uh, new algorithms in particular for Baldwin, Copeland, Kemeni, Kim Rouge, Nansen, Rank Test, Split Cycle, and Viano. And also some new rules, uh, namely K approval and Slater. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. You can all uh, unmute your microphone and give a round of applauses. And we are now ready for questions. There were first a series of clarification of clarification question about the data by uh, oh, let's go up. Um, but Dominic, by uh, Judy, uh, perhaps one of them can uh, ask the question. Yes, yeah, so I was first wondering why you are not just using preflip data. Uh, okay, in fact, um, I had already did that with preflip data in my uh, PhD day, yeah. uh, PhD report. Um, uh, in fact, what uh, what is a bit difficult with preflip data is it's. Uh, several small data sets of different natures. Hmm. Uh, and in, in fact, it's a bit weird to do a global statistics, like, okay, there is a X percent of uh, elections that are manipulable for such and such voting rule, uh, because you mix uh, things of very different natures. And th that's also why here in the article, I prefer to treat the fair vote that data set and the Netflix data set separately, um, because it, I, I think it would not make much sense to to mix them. But if you want similar results with the preflip data, just uh, go and read my uh, my PhD. <laughs> okay. And for the Netflix data, so on, on preflip there is Netflix data. Is is your way of extracting things different, or did you use? Uh, uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't use the Netflix data that was in preflip. Uh, in fact, to be honest. Uh, at the old time when I looked preflip, the, um, this Netflix data was not there, so I, I was not aware of, it, of its uh, existence. Uh, so I cannot, uh, just now I cannot tell you if I do the same as uh, as Nicolas Mattei or not, because I, I don't know, I, I should have a look at it. Okay. Uh, you also, uh, Dominic, a question about the euro bars? Yeah, finally, so, so so what do the black lines mean? Presumably that means what comes from the yeah. approximation guarantee. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, exactly. And what did you do with the heuristics when the algorithm says maybe there's a manipulation or maybe not? I don't know. So, in fact, uh, if I take uh, any, uh, yeah, here, for example. So, here, this figure means that for Baldwin method, for example, uh, the in all the blue bar cases, so we, we, we drew, uh, in fact, uh yeah so let's say there is 2000 and something profiles okay so in the the blue proportion the algorithms answer answered yes uh in the white proportion i would say uh it answered no and in the black in the proportion corresponding to the black bar it, it answered maybe so that's okay. exactly what you thought i, I guess okay thanks uh, Rohit, you wanted to ask a question? And just, excuse me, just to uh, to uh, complete um, the, the, the answer. In fact, in the meantime, the algorithms for Baldwin, for example, uh, has been a lot uh, improved. And um, with the current version of Swamp, what you would have essentially is the same blue bar and no black bar. So in fact, the, the, the yes algorithm was already very good. Uh, what we have improved is the is the no algorithm. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, had oh, a, I had a general question. Uh, I like to talk very much. I, I, I no call, but I wanted to say that we have too much emphasis on on the on on picking the right winners, right, and not enough uh, emphasis on what happens to society as a result of the person elected. And then, of course, there is this other fact, which is that a party will nominate someone who is more likely to win rather than nominate someone who is actually good for society. So, for example, uh, I, I'm just using political example. Bernie Sanders is not very likely to be nominated, and Trump is likely to be nominated and even win the election, even in 2024. And no one would reasonably argue that Bernie Sanders is not better for society. So, what, what I'm saying is that I laid out the whole process Process, starting with the voter interest and the voter beliefs all the way to the what happens to society and we need to look at the whole algorithm and not at the middle step which is who wins that's all thank you okay uh, point taken um just in, in fact uh in the end i, I, I think i said it a, a little when i said that i was not so much concerned by uh, the influence of manipulability to the final output of the, the election but on the balance of powers that he, that it induces between the voters uh in fact my my, my concern is really that um uh when there is a big problem of manipulability in your voting role each time you vote you will have a moral dilemma yeah. Uh, and a practical dilemma also, because you need uh, good information in order to, to, to cast uh, the, the best strategic ballot. And this induces a, um, a problem of balance of power. And in fact, uh, the, fa the, the, the question of electing the Condorcet winner or not uh, is also related to that, not only to the quality of the outcome, but also to the manipulability. Because uh, as soon as voting rules um, meet uh, a very... Um, uh, a very minor property. Uh, in fact, the only uh, equilibria that we, that you can have in terms of game theory are elect the Condorcet winner. So if you don't elect the Condorcet winner, you know that you will be uh, vulnerable to, uh, to manipulation. Thank you. Okay. Marcus, you wanted to elaborate on that too, or it's okay? Well, I'll elaborate if it's not already clear. I and mean, the question is, how big are the coalitions you need to achieve these manipulations? Yeah. Um, so um, I, I did not measure that. Uh, I, I did not plug that, to, 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 be, to be exact. Uh, in fact, historically, uh, Swamp was not designed so well to compute exact, to compute that kind of thing. And it's still not designed well. In fact, that's a very, very difficult question to, to answer from a computational point of view. And it's a bit easier to, uh, to, uh, to answer the other question that I mentioned, uh, which is the constructive coalitional manipulation problem. So you, you take only the sincere winner, uh, the sincere voters, and you ask how many manipulators you, you would need to, to add uh, 
um, to, uh, to manipulate. And in fact, that's a very different question from, uh, from the one saying, I keep everybody and I just want to change the ballots of some of the potential manipulators, which is a much harder problem because you also need to, to choose which subset of the manipulators you want to change and which subset you don't want to change. Um, so if I could just follow up. So if I understand correctly, um, this means that um, in the cases where you detected the possibility of coalitional manipulation, you're using algorithms which give you a non-constructive proof. I guess I naively assumed that the way you detected the possibility of coalitional manipulation was by actually constructing a manipulated coalition, but you're saying that that's not how the algorithms work. No, yes, that's what we do. But in fact, uh, what, in fact, in, okay, so you take your profile, you, you keep only the, the voters who prefer uh, the natural winner W to the, the target candidate C. And in fact, in all the rules that we consider here, if you are able to manipulate the, the election by adding uh, 10 manipulators, you know that it's possible with 10 or, 10 or more uh, because you have uh, reasonable uh, monotony properties in all these rules. Uh, so if we have, uh, let's say, uh, 40 manipulators, potential manipulators, what, what we say is simply that we try to solve this problem. We say, okay, it's possible with 10. So it's also possible, and, and we show how it is possible with 10. Um, and we say, okay, if it's possible with 10, it's uh, trivially possible with, uh, with 40. Sure. Uh, or in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the other case being, we, we, we know that it's necessary, we show that it's necessary to have at least uh, 50 and we have only 40, so it's not possible. So that's typically the problem that we, we are solving in practice. Uh, but it's a slightly a different problem from finding the minimal number of person that you need to change in the original profile to, to be able to manipulate. Oh, yeah, I wasn't asking for a minimum. I mean, I use the word typical in my question because I sort of assume that when you run your experiments, you find some manipulating coalition. I, I agree that it's going to be very difficult to prove that it's really a minimal manipulating coalition. But I, I thought you could give us an idea, roughly speaking, how often they are how big they are typically, 10%, 20% of the population, something like that? So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, well, I can't answer to your question exactly. I, I can answer to a variant of this question. Uh, that, that is, um, so when you have your only your sincere uh, voters and you want to add a minimal number of voters, how many uh, will you need to add? And that's okay. precisely what we measure in, the, in this last, um, the, in this last uh, plot, um, saying, for example, that in a, in a range voting, typically you will need um, one sixth of the number of um, of sincere voters that, that you have. Okay, great. All right. Thank so, you. In, okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, there are still a few questions. Perhaps we should go for short answers because we're running out of time. There was one. Uh, Interesting question by Klaus, maybe, and perhaps quickly <clears throat> with a very quick answer, perhaps. Uh, well, I'm wondering if you step away from these um, uh, actual data, if you if you imagine artificially constructed data in one way, in multidimensional setting or some other setting, uh, how uh, could you imagine some setting where the IRV uh, type mechanisms would be quite manipulable? Uh, I can imagine something extremely artificial. Uh, uh, yeah, I take uh, three examples of profiles uh, that are manipulable for IRV and that are not manipulable for, I don't know, Schultz rule, for example. And uh, I, I take the culture that uh, draws one of these three profiles uh, uh, with equal probability. Well, okay. Uh, that, that, that's extremely artificial. Oh, yeah. Uh, but in a reasonably reasonable uh, artificial uh, model of, uh, of culture. I don't know. And uh, this time, in fact, I, I'm working on a, a theoretic, theoretical work on a perturbed culture, which is, a, let's say, a variant of Malos. Uh, and essentially, we can show by theory that uh, IRV and similar methods uh, are much less manipulable than all the other voting rules. OK. Um, um, one point of so bad yeah. multi-winner manipulation, quick point. 
Uh, it's not implemented in Swamp at all. Uh, in fact, multi-winner manipulation, uh, there, there are a lot of practical problems. The, the first one is how you uh, extend the preferences of the voters from the candidates, the set of candidates to the set of uh, committees. So there are, you, you have uh, as many variants as uh, there are extensions of the preferences of the voters. And then you will have a lot of uh, computational problems. The first, you have many uh, common multi-winner multi rules uh, that are difficult uh, to compute, just to compute the winner, uh, like uh, Chamberlain courant, uh, proportional approval voting, and so on. Uh, so uh, I expect that computing uh, coalitional manipulation uh, would be just a nightmare. So you, 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 you would really have a practical problem. But... Uh, okay. The reason for asking it is that I remember you mentioned that uh, IRV-like voting rules are monotonous, but I remember that uh, IRV is not monotonous no. in a multi-winner situation. Yeah. So how crucial is this monotonicity for your entire machinery? Yeah, in, in fact, there's, there are many notions of manipulability for voting rules. And here, the, the notion of manipulability of uh, monotonicity that I was uh, talking about is very simple. It's, it is to say, if W wins in a profile, you can add a voter and have W still winning. That's a very weak property of monotonicity. And all these rules uh, meet this property. I think we had a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. We should go for, uh, we should stop now. I want to. I have my own question, which was, what was the name of the cat we see in the back? <laughs> uh, I, I was a bit afraid that you will come on your keyboard at some point, so. <laughs> yeah. Oli. Oli. Okay, so uh, now we go for the traditional coffee break, and we're back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Let's start with the, new, the other speaker, with Zoe, and she will speak about aggregation. Please, Zoe, the floor is yours. Good. Hi. You see everything? You hear everything? Good. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm also very happy to, to be talking at this seminar. Uh, I'm going to present a um, dynamical process uh, for incomplete preferences, and uh, I want to discuss its effects on uh, group consensus. This is um, joint work with um, uh, Shirin, who is in Sydney, and Simone, who is in Amsterdam. It was already published this summer in Ichikai, but uh, I thought it would be nice to, to repeat it a bit here because I think there are a lot of interesting uh, follow-up questions that, uh, yeah, I would like you to remember. Uh, unfortunately, they're both in Sydney right now, so they're not attending the seminar, which means I'm not looking at the chat and probably you will not get any concrete answers to your questions, uh, but I will uh, see it afterwards. So let's start with a motivating example. As always, we have a group of agents that want to make a collective decision. And here we have five um, conference organizers that need to decide on an online platform to use for their next online conference. So they have three options here, A, B, C. We call them Appear, Bridge, and Synect. And the organizers have different uh, preferences over these uh, apps. These preferences may be complete because some organizers may have never seen some of the apps, they have never used them, so they have just uh, no opinions about them. For example, here, the first uh, two agents say, I prefer A to C, but I have no opinion about B. The other two agents say, I prefer B to A, no opinion about C. And the last organizer has no opinion about the specific um, alternatives, uh, surprisingly. <laughs> so the question is, um, how, how do we reach a consensus? How can we decide here which is the best uh, platform to use? From these preferences, it's not very clear to, to, to judge, to see this. So we suggest that the committee meets and there is a chair and the chair suggests, okay, let's take two alternatives at a time. Let's discuss about pairwise comparison. So what do people think about A and B? The people who have no opinion on A and B will say nothing. The people who have an opinion will express it. Here, everyone who has an opinion will say B is better than A. Okay, and we assume now that the agents who have no opinion on A and B will just adopt the opinion of the majority, the strict majority of the agents who has an opinion about these two alternatives. This is quite reasonable because in this local setting, we 
only uh, think about two majorities. So following, sorry, two alternatives. So following the majority is uh, quite, uh, quite an easy uh, solution. So the agents will fill uh, their preferences with, um, uh, with the opinion of the majority. And we will also assume here that uh, in every uh, round of this process, the agents will uh, also complete uh, transitively uh, their, um, their close transitively, their preferences. So uh, here, if the agents say, I prefer B to A and A to C, they will also say, I prefer uh, B to C. This is just uh, to have admissible preferences in every round of the process. Okay, the chair says, now we can discuss B to C, what do people think? Again, the majority and actually all the people who have an opinion on this alternative say B is better uh, than C. So the remaining fill uh, the preferences. And with respect to A and C, also the majority uh, says A is better than C now. So we can have uh, a complete version of our preferences and there is nothing else to discuss at this point. But more importantly, now uh, an obvious consensus exists. This is alternative B, that every agent uh, now ranks on top of every other alternative. And our goal here is to study exactly this uh, kind of uh, majority dynamics and this kind of uh, consensus um, appearance. Uh, a bit more details on our model. We have, again, as a standard, uh, find a set of alternatives, find a set of agents. The agents have partial orders uh, over the alternatives. These are uh, strict and transitive orders, but maybe complete. And they give us a profile of preferences. We also define and update order sigma over all pairs of alternatives, all ordered pairs of alternatives except, of course, that we don't compare alternatives to themselves. And the idea is that starting from a profile P, uh, the, the pairs of alternatives are discussed according to the order sigma. Uh, now, as I already explained, when a pair AB is discussed at the time T, every agent uh, that doesn't have already a preference, an opinion on, on this pair, will update uh, according to the strict majority and only those agents will update. And if there is a tie, if exactly the same number of agents say A is better than B and B is better than A, then we will use the order of the pair um, in the update order to break the tie. So if the pair is A, B, the tie will uh, be broken in favor of A. This is why we, it's important that we take uh, the ordered pairs. This is the main question now, what are the effects of these majority dynamics on group consensus? And to answer this question, I will have to define uh, first what I mean, I mean by effects, <laughs> and second, what I mean by consensus. And uh, I will not give very general and abstract definitions, but very concrete ones. Uh, so here is, for example, what we may mean by an effect is what we call consensus preservation. This holds uh, for the majority dynamics if for every uh, initial profile, whenever there exists a consensus initially, then for every update order, there will be a consensus in the end. So there is no way that we can damage consensus. And what I mean by consensus here, for example, uh, could be a Condorcet winner. We already saw it in the previous talks. A Condorcet winner is an alternative that um, uh, wins a pairwise uh, comparison, a uh, majority uh, pairwise comparison over every other alternative. And now the first uh, idea is that, okay, Condorcet uh, is a majority-based uh, concept and we talk about majority dynamics. So probably they're pretty consistent. So probably Condorcet is a safe consensus to, to look at for this process. And I already <laughs> say this is not, uh, this is not so easy to see uh, immediately, but for more than three alternatives, uh, majority dynamics actually do not uh, guarantee um, the preservation of a Condorcet consensus. And here is an example of a profile where uh, this uh, fails. So you have these three agents and initially you have only the solid arrows as their preferences and W is a Condorcet winner, not very difficult to see. Now let's say we update on BC first, you can see that the first and the last agents prefer B to C. 
so the middle agent will also complete this arrow. But for transitivity reasons, the middle agent will also complete the arrow BW. Now, if we update on BW, the second and the third agents disagree. One says BW, the other says WB. And for tie breaking, uh, B uh, will beat W for the first agent. And now W uh, is not a Condorcet winner anymore in the final profile, but also no other alternative is a Condorcet winner. So indeed, because of the exact assumptions of our model, a Condorcet winner may disappear. We also ask, okay, let's say we don't really look at the cases uh, where we really lose consensus, but we only care about what uh, changes in the consensus. So can, it, can this really uh, be bad? Can we have um, a bad alternative ten, turn into a consensus? And the answer is uh, also yes. Actually, an initial Condorcet loser may even turn into the Condorcet winner with this process. For three alternatives, we have uh, half better news. So existence is preserved, but still not identity. Uh, but we also try to find some more uh, positive news. So we look at some restricted domains uh, and we uh, do find that um, when all agents uh, report strict weak orders, both uh, the um, existence and the identity of consensus is preserved. Strict weak orders are quite natural uh, uh, orders that can capture preferences. They say the alternatives are ranked in different levels and alternatives from a higher level are all preferred to alternatives from lower levels. We also uh, move uh, to other uh, types of effects beyond uh, this kind of preservation. We define control. We say that the majority dynamics enable positive control. When for all profiles that have initial consensus, there exists some update order so that we uh, have consensus in the end. Intuitively, this means that one could control the update order to make sure the consensus is preserved. This is a weaker requirement than a full preservation of consensus. And quite analogously, we say that the majority dynamics enable negative control. If for our profiles that don't have initial consensus, either we can choose an update order to also not have consensus in the end, or we can choose two different update orders that uh, lead us to do different consensus alternatives. So basically, we can make sure there is no unique consensus. Uh, we find that the majority dynamics enable both positive and negative uh, control of uh, Condorcet consensus. And uh, here, the, the proof is not very difficult. Uh, the, here, we can really make use of this majoritarian flavor of Condorcet because we can choose the exact update order we want. Uh, so here is the proof idea for positive control. Let's say you have an initial profile, A is the Condorcet winner, then you select the update order that first places uh, B, takes all the pairs, that, sorry, takes all the pairs that uh, place A in front. So you can have A, B, A, C, A, D, and so on lexicographically, and then it doesn't matter. You take an arbitrary uh, way. Then when you start with the pair A, B, you know, because A is a Condorcet winner, a majority prefers it over B, and all the other agents will also follow this um, pairwise preference. So the majority of A over B will be preserved. And with transitivity, this cannot go wrong. Then you look at A, C. Again, the same holds. A is preferred by a majority over C. It cannot go wrong. You continue. So A will always be the Condorcet winner in the end. Uh, we also have looked at different um, consensus notions be be besides uh, Condorcet winner. And all the notions I will present here generalize existing ones uh, in the literature of voting for uh, complete preferences, but we uh, extend them to the incomplete case. So we have to define what we mean here uh, by a top alternative of a, of a preference, an incomplete preference. There are two options. We say that an alternative is undominated for an agent when it has no other alternative above it, and it is dominant when it has all other alternatives below it. 
So we can have an alternative that is unanimity and dominated. This is a consensus notion. This means that for all agents, this alternative is a dominated or unanimity dominant equivalent. We can also say the alternative is majority and dominated or majority dominant, very analogously. And we say that an alternative is plurality and dominated. If it is undominated uh, for a, a strictly larger number of agents than every other alternative, same uh, analogous uh, for a plurality dominant. Okay, I hope you digested this uh, quickly. So here is a, a quick uh, summary of the results. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, the preservation of Condorcet consensus fails for the general case, but uh, holds for our restricted domains. Positive and negative control uh, hold uh, for Condorcet consensus. You can move and look at the last line of the table so to get an idea for unanimity dominant alternatives. What happens is that when an alternative is dominant for everyone, the arrows that make it dominant for every other alternative already exist for all agents. So during our process, this will not change because arrows don't get flipped, they only appear. Uh, so this alternative will just very naturally remain unanimity dominant in the end. This is why preservation of consensus happens. Now for negative control, what may happen and uh, it would fail is that initially you have a profile with, without a consensus because an alternative is almost unanimity dominant, but a little arrow misses from somewhere. But it could happen that no matter how we update uh, the preferences, uh, this alternative will be a unanimity dominant one in the end when we have a complete uh, profile. So this means that we cannot negatively uh, control the, um, the consensus. Uh, similar intuitions hold for the different notions, but the, uh, they are quite uh, tailored to the different definitions. So I cannot say there is a, a unified uh, theory behind that. But I think, uh, yeah you can still gain some insights on how the process works for the different ones. I will let you look at the paper if you want to do that. And uh, I will move to the final uh, part of this work, which uh, is about some simulations exper simulation experiments we done. Uh, basically, our motivation was that the, the, the more theoretical part of the work uh, concerned uh, existence questions. So we have uh, some possibilities. Let's say it, uh, it is uh, possible to, to damage consensus just by uh, finding one example or impossibilities, uh, which, yes, are more general uh, proofs. But basically, we wanted to know how common are these examples we found. And also, how what does this mean about the the judgment that uh, we we have of the process. So for Condorcet winner, for example, you can see that, um, or although I said that yes, preservation of consensus fails, we find that um, in almost all cases that we generated, uh, preservation holds. So the counter example we found is actually extremely rare. Um, the same feeling uh, we got for plurality and dominated consensus and for, uh, we, we did that for all the combinations of uh, notions I presented, but here I am focusing on those. Uh, while again, the, the, the bad news were like, if we can lose consensus, for example, yes, it can happen, but they're not uh, so serious ones because you can see that uh, it actually almost never happens. Um, and yeah, for majority and dominated consensus, you see that the pattern really changes. To me, it's just interesting to see how it, the different notion of consensus really changes um, what happens. And there, the difference is uh, made by whether you look at profiles with initial consensus or without. If there is initial consensus, the number of agents doesn't affect really what you observe. Still, the, good, the news are quite good. If there is no initial consensus, 
uh, the more agents you have, the the worse um, the worse you get. Uh, basically, it's very difficult to generate a majority and dominate alternative. And uh, we also ran some experiments about uh, control. Uh, very quickly, again, uh, we find quite quite good news. You can see here that just our, our theory is confirmed. So for Condorcet winner, we can always preserve consensus. Uh, we can always preserve identity. We already know that. Uh, but what we didn't know is that although we could lose consensus, um, it's very, uh, very rare that um, very few orders actually uh, make this happen. So here we, we check over all orders and we see that uh, very, very rarely uh, you can have one that damages consensus. So in the end, Condorcet and the majority dynamics are quite compatible, I would say. Uh, I think you all got the main message. I don't need to summarize much, but I do want to stress that I think there are quite some interesting computational uh, problems uh, that arise uh, here. For example, uh, we could look at the computational complexity of control problems, such as selecting um, the right update order to achieve some goal. It's not always straightforward to know which one it is. Uh, then we can also yeah, look at good update orders in the sense of minimizing some number of updates or reaching quicker, uh, quick, more quickly the outcome. And in cases where um, uh, guarantees about the existence or the identity of consensus are not achieved, uh, it would be also good to know how, how far do we get from a consensus outcome. So some ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. We had already one question in the chat by Peter. Yes, for clarification, thank you for your presentation. If I have a strict opinion and that opinion gets involved in the comparison and loses against the majority of others, do I have to give it up or do I only have to follow the majority in case I didn't have an opinion to start with? Yes, exactly. Only the the latter. So if you already have an opinion, you keep it until the end. Okay, because that would be a far di quite different model, I think. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I think, I mean, there are a lot of models with opinion revision and uh, uh, yeah, but I, I really wanted to look at the incompleteness and what this changes by itself in the outcome. I don't want to change anything that already is uh, completed. Thank you. That clears up the, my question. Thanks. Close, and then Marcus. Um, for your uh, simulation, I that in if you have partial orders, then you might there may be interesting questions how they look like, how the typical partial orders look like, how they look in relation to each other. So there could be, you could, for instance, vary the degree of completeness, how many comparisons are made, or the depth of a partial order. There could be the, the conclusions may not be, <clears throat> may depend on that. I mean, you could think if, if there's, for instance, a lot of incompleteness to start with, then there is more difficulties in, in getting consensus than if you are close to completeness. Yes. Yes, uh, that's a very good point. I think almost uh, it, it's a very common uh, point, and uh, uh, we have checked. We we have checked for the degree of uh, of completeness, and uh, we also expected some variance. And actually, there is not so much. Uh, we don't see that the degree of completeness of a preference affect much. Uh, uh, what happens in the simulations, except for very extreme cases. If it's already complete, there's nothing to do, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's totally incomplete, there is everything to do. But uh, in the middle, uh, you, there is no much variance and we don't see a clear pattern towards the edges. Uh, but in general, yes, we could check also other parameters. As you said, we haven't checked the, um, the depth, uh, but also, in general, I think putting more structure to the domains would help. Like besides the simulations, 
as I said, like we're restricting the domain to a special structure, it changes the outcome. So clarifying exactly how the counterexamples look would be interesting. And I guess maybe to if, if there are certain asymmetries, I mean, one problem is everything is very symmetric. You have no basis really, if, if there are certain asymmetries then there are basis to break symmetries and to overrule certain patterns, which at one level of aggregation show up, but not in a not different way. Yes. Yeah, it's a good point. It may be different for the different notions, the symmetries that matter. Yes. Yeah. Should look more into it. Marcus. So this is sort of an interpretive question, but I think it maybe feeds back into some kind of technical modeling decisions as well. So the, the, the question, um, basically the original motivating question is in some sense, um, if I have an incomplete preference order um, and I observe the majority opinion, what is my reason for updating my preference to sort of like match the majority, right? Uh, and I think the answer depends upon how we interpret preferences and how we interpret the social choice problem. So, you know, broadly speaking, there are kind of two extremes, right? One extreme is it's a problem of pure preference. Like it's just like, I don't know, what what restaurant do we want to go to for dinner tonight? Something sort of very, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just about tastes. And at the other extreme, you have the kind of Condorcet jury theorem interpretation where there's kind of like an objectively correct fact of the matter, right? There's an objectively correct order and we all the voters receive some kind of noisy signal about that order, right? So uh, in the first case, if it's just about peer preferences, I don't see a strong reason why I would be incentivized to update my preferences to match the majority, except perhaps out of some kind of psychological conformity or some desire to see consensus, right? I mean, you know, if I have no preference between, you know, I don't know, pizza and Japanese food, I have no preference, like I just don't, right? But in the second case, it makes a lot of sense, right? So I think that your model of preference revision makes more sense in the kind of epistemic scenario where there's an objective fact of the matter. And then when I observe the majority, I can interpret that as a kind of a signal, like a bunch of other people think A is better than B, maybe A actually is better than B. The reason why this is relevant is because that suggests that you could kind of come up with certain kinds of stochastic processes that would generate these partial orders, right, based upon the sort of noisy signals that the voters receive. And that might cause certain structures of partial orders to show up more often than others. This would actually get back to Klaus's question, right? Like you might see that, you know, depending upon the sort of stochastic process, which generates the signals that the voters receive, certain kinds of partial order structures tend to show up, which has certain consequences. Uh, it also creates the possibility of maybe enriching your model in a certain way, right? So for example, right now in your model, either I have a preference between A and B or I don't, right? But we can imagine a slightly more nuanced model where I receive a signal with varying degrees of credibility. Like maybe I receive a very strong signal that A is better than B, or maybe I receive only a very weak signal that A is better than B. And then if I receive a strong signal that A is better than B, like then that could not be overturned by uh, any majority of any size. But if I receive only a very weak signal, I'm kind of almost undecided between A and B. I kind of, I think A is better than B, but I'm yeah, not really sure. In that case, if there's a strong majority of, of A in favor of B, that might cause me to reverse my preference, right? Because I would regard that as like credible information that actually A really is better than B. Um, so uh, that might, create a kind of a more complicated model, but also maybe a model which has um, more interesting dynamics. Um, and also the, another, th another thing I want to ask sort of to sort of close this all out is if one adopts an epistemic interpretation, then one can also ask questions about, okay, the, the, the equilibrium which is reached by the majority dynamics, can you say anything about it from an epistemic point of view? In other words, like, what is the probability that this majority dynamics converges to kind of the correct preference order? I mean, in the case where there is a correct preference order. All right, so that's that's my sort of bundle of questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. I think uh, this also makes a lot of sense, and uh, yeah, we have thought a lot about it. Like, what's exactly the interpretation we are giving to the preferences, and how does this justify this uh, assumption of following the majority? Um, so, my main problem for saying that this is a model relevant for. Um, for truth tracking for epistemic um uh yeah context is that then i see the i see the questions being very different in the end like this idea of what happens to consensus if it changes if not i don't see it 
to be relevant. Uh, I don't want consensus in, in truth tracking. I just, uh, I want some decision that reflects the truth in some way. Uh, so I think the, the current model uh, really uh, is motivated more uh, by this idea of, um, of uh, preference aggregation. I think it has a lot of, it's very interesting to look at this type of dynamics for the epistemic setting, but with different kinds of questions. And for the, the preference uh, case, I think yeah, our motivation for the, the majority imitation um, is more, yeah, some kind of uh, conformity bias, some kind of psychological uh, motivation. And it happens quite often, like when you're in a group and you just don't know people, the first thing that people tell me, this is really just talking with uh, the, the, the general public, always people just go for the majority, especially if there are two options, there is no way to convince them to do anything else. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's just a psychological um, feeling that uh, we rely on to, to follow the majority. Okay, thank you very much. Judy has a question. Judy? So Peter has convinced me that it, the question is not meaningful of whether there are cycles and Peter points out that there is um, transitivity, so no. Never mind. Yes, but it is it is actually a, um, a lemma somewhere in our paper that uh, with this process cycles uh, will never appear. Uh, if if the yeah, it, it's because we take the transitive closure every time. Uh, but yeah, you need to think a little bit about it. It's not close. <laughs> M microphone. If I'm just following up with the conformity interpretation, wouldn't that naturally be a conformity about choices or pair comparisons? Why would I then take the step further and now uh, induce some transitivity, which prevents me actually to be conforming where, where I always want to conform? Yeah, I, 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 I'm restricted in con conforming to all pairwise comparisons if I impose transitivity. So in a way from the conformism, uh, put it differently from a conformism point of view, why not give up transitivity and just conform ad hoc, just pair by pair? Yes. Uh, yes, I think these are two, two separate assumptions. Um, you could also drop transitivity, things will, will change a lot in the results. I think transitivity really is not justified by this conformity, is more, uh, well, it's technically useful, but in, in my mind it's justified if you think that someone points this out to you, like in a committee, okay, you say you have an opinion A or B, you follow the majority, you say, okay, yeah, A is better than B. And then someone says, okay, but you actually already think that B is better than C. So it's like, oh yeah, sure. So A is better than C. So some kind of rationality condition, but it's not, now it's really a rationality condition in the economic sense and not a conformity psychological condition. It's a separate uh, assumption. It needs separate justification. Yeah. Okay, I, I perhaps one, we have a question. Is Bill on a plane? I guess yes. It seems to be on a plane. He seems to be on a plane. And uh, I yeah, hope I am broadcast. He's, he's on a train. I've just been informed. <laughs> I was wondering whether it was a train or a plane. Perhaps we should vote on it. Uh, I have a, a last question, uh, perhaps. Um, I guess your dynamic is very sensitive to the starting point. So it could be easily manipulable if I not showing a bit of my preference. Uh, perhaps I could lead to the election of A or B or C or something else. And perhaps I should even perhaps sometime abstain to give a preference. So to some extent, uh, manipulate the outcome of dynamic by abstaining. Have you, have you looked at all these questions? No. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's surprising because, uh, yeah, I would immediately look into <laughs> manipulation. Uh, but not yet, I think. Um, Yes, I think 
it makes a lot of sense. And I do like a lot uh, manipulation in the yeah partial order setting because you have many more ways. You can, yeah, you can. You can abstain. The, you can abstain. You can I, abstain. Oh, I don't know. You I can don't even know. untruthfully, untruthfully uh, make up a preference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can check under all these different types of manipulation what happens. Um, I think then it would be more interesting though to introduce some voting rules in this setting because, uh, yeah, on purpose I didn't look into specific voting rules, but on different, yeah, consensus um, notions. Uh, but then we can also, yeah, just see what happens to the border winner with these uh, dynamics and introduce manipulation, all these things, yes. Very interesting. <laughs> well, I think we're done for today. Ulo, you have a last announcement. Yes, so the announcement is about the next seminar. So we're going to meet next year on uh, Friday the 13th at the, the same time. Two speakers again, it's going to be Piotr Skofron and Antonin Massé. And one of the two abstracts is already on the website and the other one should be there quite soon. As well. So I hope to see you there. So thank you very much, Ulu, and thank you for having chairs the seminar for more than two years, because you will step down soon. I will chair it once more. You'll chair it once more. Thank you very much. Thank you.